Hi, I'm Steve Eisenberg. Welcome to the show. We're here today with Regina Pasitti, who is a Justice of the Peace in Waltham. Hi, Regina. Nice to be here. Tell me, what did you go through? How did you decide to become a Justice of the Peace? It was a very interesting process. At the time, I was working as a school adjustment counselor in, at Waltham High School. And all educators need second jobs in order to survive financially. I did not want to go back to retail. I had done retail all through high school and college. And I was thinking, what else could I do in my free time? I had a couple of friends who were JPs and they said, why don't you become a JP? And I said, JP, what's that? A wedding celebrant, wedding officiant. So I decided, okay, how do I go about doing that? That seems like a fun thing. And they told me that I needed to apply to the Secretary of State's office and see if there was an opening in my community because it is according to population. So I did that and I was commissioned as a JP. I had to wait several months. I guess they check out your background and make sure that uh, you are a person of good character. At the time, um, working as a social worker, I was also, um, it's a tough job. You listen to a lot of problems. And I thought being a JP would be a happy occasion and a nice contrast to what I did as a school social worker. And coincidentally, at that time, I'd had my heart broken by somebody. So I thought, what better way to uh, heal my heartbreak than to see the happiness of others? What does it take to become a justice of the peace, other than by applying to the, uh, the city and town, you, pro you talked about that, but what does it take to become a good justice of the peace? To be a good justice of the peace, you really need to be a good public speaker, which I think I was because I had also worked as a teacher. You need to be able to communicate well with people, which again are things that are required as a teacher and a school social worker. You need to have people endorse you from the town or city in which you live. Uh, as to your being a, of good character. Once you get the commission, you usually find someone to mentor you, which I did. I had two people to mentor me. One person was actually very generous in sharing her ceremonies with me. And there's also a professional association which provides training. And I attended some of their meetings, watched them do sample ceremonies. And actually now, 25 years later, I'm an officer in that association, and I provide training to new JPs. So it's kind of come full circle for me, which is very interesting. Is there any special education or training that you would go through uh, to go from being a lay person to being a justice of the peace? I don't think there's any training per se. You can find courses online that cost thousands and thousands of dollars to become a celebrant. Very few JPs take those courses because of the cost. However, as I said, most people are public speakers. You will find a lot of teachers, a lot of lawyers. I think because it's a legal contract that you are witnessing between uh, a couple, you will find a lot of lawyers in the field too. So I think people sort of get into it by virtue of where they are professionally in their careers. Can you think of any courses, for instance, in high school that you find were useful to becoming a justice of the peace? I would say that anything in the dramatic arts would be helpful. I actually was an English drama major at college, and when I was in high school I was very involved in the school theater and very involved in productions. So I think English, dramatic arts, those kinds of things are high school things that would lead you to have an interest. In college and maybe beyond, were there courses that you found useful? Uh, yes, again, the, the, the drama courses that I took. I took some speech courses in college. 
I also took drama courses in college and I took writing courses. Very often, even though you can find ceremonies prepared for you by other JPs or even online, if you just Google wedding ceremonies, you will come up with a ton of ceremonies. Um, one of the things I offer, if a couple wants it, is a customized ceremony. I will write the ceremony for them. So the writing classes that I took, both in high school and college, prepared me to uh, write a good ceremony for someone. What challenges do you find being a justice of the peace? Right now, the biggest challenge to being a justice of the peace are the existence of one-day officiants. Um, I think the current generation is very much into do-it-yourself, whether it's photography, flowers, cake decorating. So couples will often ask friends to do things for their wedding, and I certainly understand it's a cost-saving measure. However, it does cut into our business. Um, and we were also limited by what we can charge for a ceremony by the state. Um, if we do just a basic ceremony, if we offer special requests to couples, we do customized ceremonies, we can charge additionally for that as long as we disclose our uh, services and our costs in writing to the couple. Uh, but the one day officiants are, are challenging in that if you have your Uncle Fred do your ceremony for you, he may not be able to prepare a good ceremony he may be so emotionally involved with you that he might either cry throughout the ceremony and not be heard, or he might laugh hysterically. So some people have had good experiences asking their relatives and friends to do ceremonies, and other people have not had such good experiences. It really is a personal preference. Um, I've had many couples say to me that they would never ask a friend or relative because they want their friend or relative to relax and enjoy and be in the moment with them. And other couples said, oh absolutely, why would I have a stranger do something when I have someone that I know and knows me well? Um, so it is a personal preference, but many JPs are struggling because of the one-day officiants. And the one-day officiants also uh, the paperwork that has to be filed afterwards, it's very specific how you file the paperwork in terms of lots of regulations to fill out the marriage license that has to be submitted to City Hall. So city clerks often return the licenses to the one-day officiants. People that say they want to get married and then you never hear from them again after you have given them a lot of information. And I appreciate people just saying, no, I'm booking with somebody else because I'm not left hanging. Sometimes people say they want to book with you, but when you ask them questions about what they want, they delay responding to you, and then it's a week before the wedding, and you're contacting them saying, well, you wanted this, and you wanted that, and you know, it's not good to let me know the night before. You should be worried about it the night before, and neither should I. So the challenges can be that my timeline is different than their timeline. People often wait until the last minute. So you have to, you have to be very good at sort of handling people and negotiating people. Some diplomacy is required for this. Think about when you first became a justice of the peace. Okay. What, what did you go through to get started and get your business going? Uh, in those days, there was no World Wide Web, so it was much more challenging. JPs advertised in phone directories, and it was very expensive to get a business listing. Um, most JPs get a business card and try to circulate it to different, they give it to friends, they give it to relatives. Uh, I posted it in the teacher's room at the school where I worked. I also gave it to some of the mansions in the community where I knew weddings occurred and that's how I got um, bookings. But in the beginning it was quite often for friends, relatives, friends of friends, uh, the first few years I didn't do a lot of ceremonies. Once the World Wide Web came into place, I have a website now and most people nowadays to find a JP do not look at a phone book. They don't even know what a phone book is anymore. They will go online and they will Google Justice of the Peace and perhaps the community in which they live and up pops my name or somebody else's name. What's it like being a Justice of the Peace? Um, it is interesting because 
You need to respond quickly to your customers. You may get an inquiry by email or you may get a telephone call. If you are not there to answer that call, they move on to the Justice of the Peace who does answer that phone that day. But you can't always be by your phone. Once you respond to a couple, they usually want to know your availability and your costs. Those are pretty much the first two questions. Then after that, they may ask you questions about your experience, how many weddings have you done, can you do something to make their wedding different than everybody else's, which is where the experience comes in. Now that I've done so many weddings, I can offer people more than a basic ceremony. I can give them special things. For example, some couples may want to mingle sand together to uh, indicate the joining of two families. Other people may want to um, light a unity candle, again, to join two families. Some couples may want to do a wine box ritual in which the couple writes letters to each other and they place it in a box with a good bottle of wine. I do an explanation about what they've done and I say that if there's ever any difficulties in their marriage, they open the wine box, they drink the wine, they read the letters in order to remember what they liked about themselves. And hopefully that will restore equilibrium to their relationship. And if they don't have any problems, they can simply drink the wine on an anniversary. So I offer those additional special requests for people. I can educate them on what they are, or if they know a specific one they want, I can provide it for them. What makes your work interesting? The kinds of people that I meet and the stories they tell me about how they met. Um, it's quite often fascinating. More and more people are meeting online now. Uh, the stories about how long they've been together and what makes them decide all of a sudden after having been together for so many years to get married. And quite often they're very practical reasons like insurance coverage or they're getting older and they're concerned about if one gets sick, is the other one going to be allowed to make decisions for them. So the, the histories of the couples are very interesting as well as their stories. Um, I really enjoy that and the, the kinds of people I meet are not people as a retired person that I would meet anymore. Uh, people from all different countries, uh, from all different backgrounds. It, it brings a depth to my life that I ordinarily wouldn't have. Why might someone want to become a Justice of the Peace? Because it's a happy occasion. Um, for the most part I have had couples who stay together a long time, have warm memories of the day, have warm memories of me, and they often contact me when other relatives are going to be married. So there's, there can be a little bit of a family feel to it, especially if you're doing it for friends and for family members. Um, and also you have a lot of control as to how busy or how not busy you want to be. If you are going to be traveling and you don't want to book a wedding, you just tell people that you're not available. So uh, it's the self-employment aspect that's also a very good thing. Uh, unlike working for a company where you have to show up at a certain time and a certain day. You control your, your destiny, so to speak. If there is one thing that you could avoid having to deal with as a justice of the peace, what might that be? The financial aspect can be a little touchy sometimes when you tell people what your rate is, and my rates are reasonable. I obviously charge what the state says I can charge, and then if they want additional services from me, whether it's a rehearsal, whether it's a special request in the ceremony, I do charge additionally for that. But I do not like it when people start saying to me, oh, that's too expensive, I can't afford it, can you charge me less, then I feel that I have to justify my, my fees. What type of skills would you need to be a justice of the peace? You know, some people need, they need accounting fees as uh, skills if they want to um, run their business and run it profitably and keep records of what they spend and, and what they take in. Um, more and more I'm thinking of it as a hobby for me than a, than a business. Um, 
so sometimes business skills are very helpful for it. Um, in addition to the writing skills, the, the speaking skills. So kind of a combination of, of all of those areas would be best. What advice would you give to someone who's thinking about becoming a justice of the peace? I would suggest that they either go online and look at some ceremonies and see people doing ceremonies and ask themselves, is this something I can do? Or I would suggest they actually go to see, uh, contact a justice of the peace and ask them if they can observe them at a ceremony, uh, which is something that I offer to anyone that I mentor. I suggest they come and see me do a ceremony and they look at what's involved in the process of booking a couple and that's probably the best way. People don't really quite know what justices of the peace are. They're much more familiar with religious ceremonies um, because that's what they're used to growing up. When a couple decides to get married, what is the process that they go through? What do they have to do? In addition to contacting me to see about my availability and fees, they need to decide what kind of a ceremony they want. Do they want a complex ceremony with readings and rituals, or do they want a sweet, short exchange of vows? They need a location for the ceremony, which can be a mansion for which they pay $5,000 for the night and invite many, many friends, or they can actually come to my home and be married in my home, just the two of them. When you are a justice of the peace, you do not require witnesses for the ceremony. Only religious ceremonies require witnesses. So they can simply be married with me, and that's all that's necessary for the witness part of it. They do need to get a license from City Hall. They're, they have to apply together for the license and provide some sort of identification. Once they make the application process, they have to wait three days to retrieve the license from City Hall, and they have to present the license to me in order to be married. I cannot marry a couple if they do not have a license and present it to me. I have had, I had an experience this summer with a couple who called me from the road and said they had forgotten the license, they were en route, could they start without it and send somebody for it? And they would, it would arrive by the time I finished the ceremony. And I had to say that I could not do that. The law is very specific in that I must see the license uh, before the ceremony starts. And then I am the one that's responsible for completing the license, signing the license, keeping a record of the license myself, and returning it to City Hall. Once the a couple of weeks have passed after the ceremony, the couple can go to City Hall and get the official marriage certificate that they use for name changes, bank records, um, anything that they need it for legally. But the license itself is not the document that gets them the change in health insurance or the name change on the license. The license I fill out simply goes to City Hall and then they get a marriage certificate from City Hall. They are charged for the marriage license and then they are charged for the marriage certificate. And it does vary by city and town. Regina, thank you so much for being here with us today. It was my pleasure to enlighten people on what a JP does. Thank you.